So I'm going to be talking to you about a variety of things, uh, and I'll be going through this um, table of contents as I go. So what is repeat instability? So a lot of what I'm going to be telling you today uh, focuses in upon uh, what was recently published, as Manuel just told you, was published just yesterday in Cell. Um, but I'll be giving you uh, an overview of what repeat expansion diseases are uh, first. So this is a graph. Um, and on the bottom, the x-axis, is the year of discovery. Um, and this is the y-axis showing the number of repeat expansion diseases. And basically, you can see that there are different repeat expansion diseases that have been discovered. And the, the color of the box uh, encompassing the disease um, shows the repeat motif, which is shown down here. And you can see that a lot of the repeat expansions uh, share the unstable motif at different disease loci. And so CAG, CTG are very common, accounting for 16 different uh, repeat expansion diseases at different uh, loci. You'll also notice that um, over time, there was a lot of discovery in the early days using um, uh, classical genetic um, methods, but there was a lull after that, and then new technologies of sequencing have ramped up the discovery. Um, and when we published this review article last year, um, there were 69 diseases. And I can tell you there's, there's 74 now that have been published. Um, and there's at least five that I know of that haven't been published that I've seen at meetings. Um, so repeat expansions and disease, and not just disease, phenotype, are going to be rampantly discovered with um, new sequencing technologies. Now, a lot of people say that these are short tandem repeats. This is actually not true because some of the repeats are very large repeats. Sometimes the motif is like 3.4 KB. It's huge. They can be very large, not just small, uh, short tandem repeats. They are tandem repeats for sure, but they aren't always short. And there are also very few that have been identified in non-human uh, organisms, actually non-primates um, have very few uh, instances where repeat expansions occur. So that tells you there's something that we're not really understanding why this is actually primate or human specific. So why am I interested in repeat expansions? Well, this is actually some old data and it shows that as a person um, inherits the repeat, they can change the disease of onset or the disease progression. Um, so if you inherit a very large uh, repeat expansion at the Huntington's locus, like this individual here, you can have very early age onset. And But most people, they inherit around 40 to 50 repeats and they have uh, much later onset. So most of them actually, as I said, have 40 to 50 repeats. But if you look at these individuals, actually, for the same repeat expansion size, you can have onset at around the 20s, but you can also have it in the 80s. So what's making this person different than this person? There's definitely something happening there. And so this is known to be unstable in transmissions, but what's not appreciated by a lot of people is that it's also unstable in different tissues. So a person will inherit a certain size, but as they age, the repeat will change size in different tissues. And so what I was thinking many years ago is that this could actually contribute to modifying disease. Of course, a lot of people weren't interested in that at the time, but it turns out that it is actually the truth. And I will show you that. Um, so because most people inherit this size, if you actually spread this size out for each repeat unit, you will find that changing the number of repeats by one can change the disease onset by up to three years. So that tells you that if you modify the repeat length, you can modify the onset. You can make it worse or better. And so we'd like to look at making it better. So changing it, you don't have to change it by a lot. You just have to change it by a few. So what about instability? So basically what I've told you, a person will inherit a certain size and that over time, this gets larger and larger in some tissues. It's actually even specific at the cellular level. Um, and that I can talk about as well afterwards if you're interested. But basically, 
if a person has very rapid expansion somatically, it changes the age of onset to being younger and younger. It also changes the disease progression rate and severity. So basically, understanding how this happens would be really important because what you'd like to do is you'd like to either stop those expansions or even better, you'd like to reverse them. And so understanding how these occur has really been the focus of my lab's research for the last 30 years. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a summary of what we've learned. We know that you need to have transcription across the expand and repeat to have instability. If you don't have transcription, you stabilize it, but you'd also lose the gene product. So during transcription, you form these unusual structures in the DNA. And this is a slip strand DNA. And there are protein factors, which are DNA repair proteins. And I call them DNA repair because they're actually not acting as DNA repair here. Usually these are acting in mismatch repair, but in this instance, they're actually acting as mutators. So they're driving the mutation. If you knock these out, you stabilize the repeat. So you need these to drive the mutation. And these proteins actually process these structures into expansions. So this is an unusual concept for repeat expansion disease. You have DNA repair genes that actually drive these mutations. You also have other DNA repair proteins which actually suppress these expansions. So if you knock out mismatch repair genes, you stabilize the repeat. If you knock out this, FAN1 in mice with expansions, you actually enhance expansions. So keeping this protein will actually suppress the expansions. So you have drivers and you have suppressors of instability. So a lot of people are now very interested in trying to actually suppress expansions. So they're thinking if they can attack particularly MSH3, you'd actually arrest expansions and you'd stop them from continuing to expand. So a person would inherit a certain size, but they wouldn't get any larger, so they wouldn't get any sicker. That's the idea. So I had in my title slide this uh, zipper to actually show you that DNA structure is really important. So this is your B DNA, and here is a slip strand of a CAG, here's a CTG, and they form different structures. So structure is really important. So these structures can form and repeat DNAs. My lab is working off a lot on that. And so I bring in, you could target proteins, but you could also target the DNA structure because this is a critical ingredient in the expansion process. And my lab has actually identified and reported um, in Nature Genetics, this compound NA, nethiridine as a quinolone, and it's a ligand that binds the CAG DNA structures. It does not bind to the duplex DNA. It only binds to the slip out. And it, it, it actually doesn't just arrest expansions, it actually induces these to be processed to contractions. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But there's also these DNA repair proteins, but I've also, which I'm gonna focus on today, the discovery of single strand binding proteins and the variants of those that actually are drivers or suppressors of expansions. And there's probably many other players that I haven't got on this slide that are known that are also yet to be discovered as um, drivers and suppressors of expansions. So I don't have a lot of time to talk about this data, which was published in 2020, but I will talk a little bit about it. But this compound, NA, that I told you about, it binds specifically to the CAG repeats, and it actually requires mismatch repair to draw to, for its mechanism of ac action. And what I'm showing you here is a mouse, which we've injected stereotactically either saline or saline and the compound NA, which binds to those structures. And if we inject into one half of the brain in the striatum or the other half, either of these, with a Huntington's mouse that has an expansion, you can see that the mouse has inherited around 160 repeats. And in the half that's actually got saline, you can see that you're having continuous expansions in the brain of the mouse over time. So this is actually where each of these peaks is an additional repeat. If in, in the other case, you're actually injecting in NA, you can see that you're actually inducing contractions to less than what the mouse inherited. So this shows that you can actually target the DNA structure. And this is actually happening over four weeks time. So this is really quick. 
So if we actually could deliver this continuously, we'd expect to have a better effect. And we've actually done that in um, Huntington's mice and in DRPLA mice. That's another paper uh, that shows that you actually can do that. And you also improve the phenotype of the mouse. Um, and so this compound actually targets the mechanism of instability. So it's telling you that you can actually have best, um, improvements on the mutation, but also on the phenotype of the mouse. So it actually has implications for all repeat expansion diseases, which have different motifs. So remember, there's not just CAG repeat diseases. There's a whole bunch of different ones. And each structure that forms could be unique to the sequence of the motif. So we've got NA, which binds to CAG repeats. If we had something, let's say, to the C9 repeat, G4, C2, if we targeted that, or maybe GAA for phrygix ataxia, or for the RFC1, understanding what those structures are formed at each of those repeat sequence expansions would be important in identifying ligands that bind to those. So this is like opening new concepts for different repeat expansions, low size. So let's talk about modifiers. So how are modifiers found and what, what do they do? So there were many, many people who were interested in repeat expansion diseases. There were very few who were interested in the instability mechanism. And the people who were interested in the instability mechanism were like myself, trying to target mutation for therapeutic benefit, but few people thought it was important. But there's been disease modifier study screens. So remember I told you that age of onset can, mod can vary between individuals with the same repeat length. So if they take all of those people with 40 to 50 repeats with Huntington's disease, for example, and they look at what's different, they identify modifiers that make them early or late age of onset. And they've done the same thing at other repeats of different repeat sequences. And interestingly, all of these screens come up with DNA repair proteins. And the DNA repair proteins are the ones that modulate repeat expansions. Now everybody's interested in repeat instability because it's actually a modifier of disease. And it's important that they're very different sequences. So all of these repair proteins are acting on specific structures and they're independent of the sequence. So this is one of the first um, unbiased modifier screens in Huntington's where they basically found that some modifiers actually made the disease early or made it late. Um, in the individual with 40 to 50 repeats. This is a very important paper because it basically validated repeat instability as a, as a target of therapy. Um, but it's also in the same group of individuals, they identified the Huntington gene itself that came up as a modifier. So either the Huntington gene itself is a modifier of instability or a modifier of disease, or what, but in that study, they found that actually the people who had early onset versus late age, age of onset actually differed in the purity of the repeat. It turned out that it was interrupted. So basically they found that if they had um, repeats that were um, free of interruptions, they actually had a strong propensity to form uh, slip structures. Whereas, uh, excuse me, if they had um, pure repeats or interrupted repeats, they actually change the ability to have slip structure formation. So if you actually have a pure repeat, you're going to form these slip DNA structures better than if you have interruptions of CAA repeats. And that would actually change the progression of disease. So structure is important, as well as is DNA repair proteins. So these are some of the DNA repair proteins that were identified in all of these disease modifier screens. And you can see that a lot of them are mismatch repair proteins, but our friend FAN1, our friend MSH3 comes up. But there are other things like MSH2, we know that this is critical for modulating repeat instability. It did not come up in the modifier screens of any of these diseases. Does that mean it's not a modifier? Or does that mean that it's a modifier, but it can't come up? Probably that it can't come up because if you delete this, the person has mismatch repair defect completely, and they'll end up either being tumor load so high that they will not then propagate, or they will not actually be born. So 
the modifier screen can only pull up the things that it can see. So um, the other thing is that these modifiers came up for different repeats, as I told you, and the fan one came up for all of these. And some of them didn't because of different population differences, but a lot of them were the same, which validates um, these as targets. But again, I point out that not all modifiers came up, um, but I also remind you that we hypothesized that a lot of these were modifiers years before the GWAS was done. And because we did this candidate approach, maybe there are other candidates that could be involved. And I know that every time you do anything with the DNA, transcription, replication, recombination, repair, you're gonna have single-stranded DNA. And single-stranded DNA will form, and you're gonna to need to have proteins that stabilize single-stranded DNA. So we thought, looking at a major single-stranded DNA protein, binding protein, RPA, would be important. So RPA is a protein that actually composed of three subunits, RPA1, RPA2, and RPA3. There are thousands of publications on this, and it's known to be evolutionarily conserved. It's involved in denarification, repair, replication, you name it. Single-strand DNA happens, it's there. So single-strand DNA has a lot that's known to be associated with it. all of these functions. It's involved even in DNA damage response. Um, it's also involved in driving mutations, actually. Um, our immunoglobin genes change, and those are programmed healthy changes that are required. Single-strand binding protein is there. Question is, is it involved in somatic repeat instabilities that cause disease? That's one of the questions I'm asking. So when funky structures form in the DNA, you'd also need single-strand binding proteins because it would actually melt out these DNA structures to avoid mutations at these unusual DNA structures. So what about slip DNAs? Are they actually going to be regulated by RPA? So in the human genome, in primates, there is another form of RPA. So basically, RPA2, many, many eons ago, the RNA of it was inserted into the X chromosome. And in primates, that activated as a gene and it became RPA4. So RPA4 makes a protein that is very similar to RPA2, and it can still interact with RPA1 and 3. And it forms this complex called alternative RPA. So you have two forms of single-strand binding protein, RPA that's canonical and alternative RPA. And what's known about alternative RPA? Well, there's five publications. One of them says, hey, we've discovered this gene called RPA4. And then the other four basically say, I have no clue what our alternative RPA is doing. So let's look at this. So my lab asked the question, are RPA and alternative RPA involved in repeat expansions? So what we did is we worked with Richard Fall and Cur uh, Maurice Curtis, and basically we obtained some very carefully and preciously curated brains of Huntington's individuals. We also got some from the National Ataxia Foundation for SCA1, and we got also extremely precious normal controls. Believe me, these are harder to get than uh, disease brains. And basically, um, we looked at the expression level, at the transcript level of RPA1, RPA2, RPA3, and RPA4. And I hope you'll appreciate that um, there is increased expression of each of these gene products um, in the disease brains. And we looked at it both in the striatum and the cerebellum, which are differentially affected in these diseases and differentially degraded in these diseases. Um, and they're showing different levels of expansions in those different brain regions. And so this immediately caught our attention. We're like, wow, this looks like an important thing to look at. Um, and it's important because the RPA4, remember it's primate specific. It's only expressed in primates. So maybe this is one of the things we can get a handle on what's causing disease predominantly in humans. And so we, we started to look at, we looked at it by different means. We also validated it by uh, QRT-PCR. We also did it by droplet digital PCR. And it clearly we're having up to 1.5 fold, maybe two fold uh, increase. But in the RPA4, it was um, in some cases up to six fold at the RNA level. 
is it overexpressed at the protein level? So we took some of those brains and we isolated proteins and we asked for RPA2, which is unique to canonical RPA, or RPA4, which is unique to alternative RPA, we saw that it was overexpressed um, in the disease brains. Um, so clearly, um, the overexpression of these is important to look at. And so we asked the next question, is there upregulation of these going to have actually consequences on DNA repair and or on repeat instability? And so what we did is we took some human cell extracts, HeLa, and we actually knocked down RPA2 with siRNA. I think you'll appreciate that. There's the RPA2 protein in here. It's completely obliterated. Um, RPA4 um, basically does not uh, get expressed at very high levels in these cells. Um, so knocking it down isn't really that important um, because we can add, add that, but there's not much to knock down. We also took um, some purified proteins, and I'm showing you the uh, purity of these uh, um, proteins, and we use those in our experiments. So we took our cell extracts, and we asked, are there effects on DNA repair? So we started off with the GT mismatch repair. So this is base-based mismatch repair. This is actually really important. If you lose mismatch repair, you have a predominance of colorectal cancer and other kinds of cancer. So mismatch repair is important for the whole genome, including base-based mismatches. And I think you'll appreciate it. We have our starting GT mismatch here, and we take HeLa cell extracts, we're getting repair. If we actually add um, RPA, we actually enhance the repair. This has actually previously been published by multiple labs, and so we're recapitulating what they've published, but what's happening with alternative RPA. So if we add alternative RPA at low levels, we also enhance the ability to repair a GT mismatch. However, if we add it at high levels, because it's overexpressed, we actually find that we have inhibition of repair. So alternative RPA is acting differently on base-based mismatch repair. So clearly there's been an aspect of alternative uh, RPA that's been missed for just general repair, I would suggest. So what about slip DNAs? So here's a slip DNA and we're asking if this can get repaired. I can answer questions about how this assay works, but I don't have time to go over it right now. My, my lab's been working on it for many years, but basically we start off with a slip out that migrates here. And when we add HeLa extracts, it gets repaired um, as a um, fully paired uh, structure uh, without the slip out. And basically if we add RPA at increasing amounts, you can see we're enhancing the repair. If we add increasing amounts of alternative RPA, you can see we're going from repair to inhibited repair. So it's having an antagonistic effect, the two RPAs. One is enhancing repair and one is inhibiting repair, which to me is really quite striking. Even though it's sharing two of the subunits, RPA one and three, the change of RPA two to four can change the activity of this protein. Um, and the effects actually are species specific. If we add um, RPA from yeast or from bacteria, we do not have the same effect, which would suggest that those protein complexes, canonical RPA from humans or alternative RPA from humans are possibly interacting with specific proteins that other species proteins, single strand binding proteins aren't interacting with. So next question we ask is, how are these differential repair uh, outcomes mediated um, by the different proteins? So we did some simple experiments. We did binding spares. This is a band shift experiment. We're adding increasing amounts of RPA, and we're clearly getting multiple shifted species um, for a slip DNA. If we take alternative RPA um, protein, we add it to our slip outs, we get a shift, but it's different from all of these, and it's only uh, unimolecular. So, Clearly the interaction is happening, but it looks like it's a different type of interaction. So then we ask, can it actually melt these DNA structures? So Maria Spee's lab did these experiments and they're really very beautiful experiments. Um, and I'm gonna try and explain these to you. Uh, so we have a slip out, which has actually got fluorophores on it, and we can measure by FRET analysis whether we're separating the DNAs or not. 
And so basically here we are in a molar ratio, mostly of RPA or only R RPA. And we're asking, is it melting? And it's melting so fast that we can barely detect it. So it's melting very quickly. If we add increasing amounts, molar ratios of canonic, of, excuse me, alternative RPA relative to canonical RPA, I think that you'll appreciate that we are dramatically slowing the rate of melting by the alternative RPA. And that's shown grammatically, uh, graphically here. So RPA is rapidly melting them and alternative RPA is slowing that process down considerably. So you could be actually changing the ability to melt these DNA structures. This could explain what's happening in our slip out repair assay. Uh, and that's dramatically slower when you have only our alternative RPA and no uh, canonical RPA. So next question is, do RPA and alternative RPA affect FAN1 nuclease activity on slip structures? So remember, I mentioned that FAN1 was identified as a modifier in these age of onset uh, uh, disease modifier screens, multiple diseases. FAN1 was a winner in all of those uh, um, different diseases. So FAN1 turns out to be an endo and an exonuclease. So that means it'll go in and it'll cut DNAs out kind of like an, uh, a pair of scissors, um, but it can also act as an exonuclease like a Pac-Man eating nucleotides. And my lab published in another study that FAN1 can excise these slip outs formed by these repeats, both endo and exonucleolytically. Um, and basically um, what we did is we labeled our slip out DNA right here and we asked if it gets digested, and it does, it gets digested endonucleolytically, these locations here. And when we actually add increasing amounts of RPA, you can see that our endonucleolytic cleavage increases. So we're enhancing endonucleolytic cleavage by canonical RPA. When we add alternative RPA, you can see we're having endonucleotic cleavage without it, but when we add increasing amounts, we are inhibiting it. So it's completely the opposite effect. Again, which is striking, you're only changing RPA2 subunit for RPA4, and you're dramatically affecting the ability for this FAN1 to be enhanced or inhibited by these proteins. And that's also been true for not just endo, but exonucleotic cleavage. So if you're interested in the exo, you can look at the paper, but it's basically the same type of phenomenon. So the next question is, does enhanced repair of slip outs by DNA rescue instability and pathogenesis? This is a difficult question to ask, but we actually reached out to my colleague to answer this question. So that brings me to this next section of my talk about modifiers of instability being modifiers of disease. So we've identified that RPA could, and alternative RPA, could potentially be modifiers of instability. Is that true? So my colleague, Masayuki Nakamori, who I've been working with for years, he actually devised a cell system, a human cell system, to address this. Basically, he has a cell line that has an expansion in it, and it's transcribed. If it's transcribed, it's unstable. If it's not transcribed, it's not unstable. The repeat doesn't change unless it's transcribed through the repeat. So this is the starting length, and over time he sees contractions and expansions, um, and the expansions can be quite high. The contractions are small, um, and basically if he takes the cell line and he overexpresses RPA2, which is unique to canonical RPA, and it enhances the whole of the protein complex, he actually suppresses expansions in this cell system. It also seems as though it's inducing contractions as well, which is interesting. So we're actually protecting Yank's expansions by overexpressing canonical RPA. What's happening with alternative RPA? Surprisingly, we see that overexpression of alternative RPA enhances expansions in this cell system. So we have very different phenomenon happening by these two protein complexes, which again, differ only by one subunit, which is unique to primates. So this is really quite striking to us and suggests that there might be something to why there's overexpression of these proteins in brains of individuals 
with these expansion diseases. So what about in, in an organism? That would be our next question. So basically we're seeing that canonical is actually suppressing expansions and alternative RPA is enhancing expansions. So what about in brains? So we can ask this for a mouse model only for canonical RPA, because remember alternative RPA is unique to primates. Mice have a pseudogene, which is different from the human RPA4. So what we did is our collaborator, um, Hitoshi Okazawa in Japan, he basically uh, produced an AAV virus that overexpressed a GFP or an RPA uh, construct. And he either injected one or the other um, and asked uh, in the SCA1 mice, which had 154 re repeats, if there was an effect on um, the disease. And we asked if there was an effect upon repeat instability. Um, and so basically the results were really quite striking. So I'm gonna take you through these. So this is a mouse that has an expansion of 130 uh, some repeats. And in its um, uh, uh, cerebellum, you're having some expansions. And this is the same type of graphical analysis. Each one of these peaks here represents an additional repeat. So the mouse has actually encouraged some expansions in the cerebellum. However, in the same mouse, in the striatum, different region of its brain, you're actually having massive somatic expansions occurring in these mice. So there's clearly tissue-specific instability. And this has actually been shown recently by um, Harry Orr and Vanessa Wheeler's group um, in patient brains. And we have similar data, um, which we haven't published yet. But you're having tissue-specific and brain region-specific, as well as cell-specific type expansions. And that's happening in these mice, these SCA1 mice. When you actually put in the overexpression construct of, AA, uh, of, of RPA, um, you're overexpressing the RPA protein, and you can completely ablate those expansions in this mouse um, in the cerebellum. And you also completely ablate those expansions in the striatum. This is a striking difference. This is a mild difference, but remember, a few repeats can make a major difference. Here, you're having a lot of repeats, but you're totally ablating the expansions in vivo. And this is over a very short period of time. So this tells you that you can actually modulate repeat instability in vivo in specific brain regions. That's really important observation, making RPA clearly a modifier of repeat instability, suppressing the expansion. So what about the mouse? Is the mouse actually any different? So this is just a graphical analysis of what I just showed you uh, on multiple mice and it is statistically significant. Um, so basically RPA is actually a suppressor of expansions in both brain regions. So what about the phenotype? So interestingly, these mice are, be they're a beautiful model of, of this disease. Um, they show many of the phenomenons that SCA1 patients do. What they don't show is a lot of brain degeneration, but they do see some brain degeneration. And so, Basically, a lot of those phenotypes are shown here in the control mice. But in the mice that are overexpressing RPA, which have suppressed expansions, you can see that you're actually partially correcting all of those phenotypes from motion phenotypes to uh, neural uh, presentation, um, as well as other, other phenomena. So basically, overexpression of RPA can actually modulate the disease in the mouse. We also found that it can actually change the polyglutamate aggregate. So when you actually produce an expanded CAG repeat, you produce a protein that has polyglutamine residues that are expanded, and that aggregates proteins, both in the brains of humans and in, in mice. And you can see those um, aggregates forming here. When you actually overexpress RPA, you're suppressing the expansions, which changes the rate at which the expansions occur, not just in the DNA, but in the RNA and in the protein. And that changes the ability to form these aggregates dramatically. And that's shown here graphically. 
it also changes the DNA damage response. And I don't have a lot of time to talk about this, but it's pretty clear that a lot of individuals are suffering neurological and neurodegenerative diseases. They show DNA damage response. And in almost every repeat disease, well, all repeat expansion disease that have been looked at, um, they see this spontaneous activation of the DNA damage response. And so when we actually overexpress RPA, do we see a change in that? And what we're looking at here is the DNA damage response relative to gamma 2 ax or P53 binding protein. And you can see that when we overexpress RPA, we are suppressing that spontaneously activated DNA damage response. Whether this actually has um, an effect at the beginning or uh, at the end of disease isn't really clear, but it suggests that there's a new player, RPA, that's involved in this in vivo, because this is brains of these mice. So question is, how do RPA and alternative RPA exert their antagonistic effects? So it has all of these phenomena that I've already showed you um, that are different between the canonical and the alternative RPA, but how actually does it do this? So that brings me to the last part of my talk, which is actually asking about RPA 1, 2, 3, and 4 protein interactome. Because if you look at the proteins that interact with these, and remember, this is a species-specific phenomenon, you're only seeing these differences for these two proteins from humans, maybe you can actually learn something about what proteins are interacting with those. And so what we did is we said, okay, so maybe there's some things that are overlapping because you have RPA 3 and 1 in the two complexes, but maybe there are things that are unique to canonical because it's interacting only with RPA2, but not RPA4, or vis-a-vis -vis the other way around, unique to RPA, alternative RPA, because it's interacting with RPA4 and not RPA2. So what we did is we said, okay, what interacts with this? What interacts with this? What interacts with that? Et cetera, for each of these in a human cell um, line. And we asked that by bio ID. So bio ID, I don't have a lot of time to explain it, but basically it's a proximity um, detector. So it can detect things that are directly interacting with another protein or interacting because they're actually close in proximity to each other inside of the cell. So it will, it will detect more than just the direct interactors, but it will also de uh, detect the direct interactors. So basically we identified unique associations with RPA1 or RPA3, which will actually reflect shared interactors with both canonical and alternative, but unique um, interactors with RPA2 or 4 will actually be unique associations between this complex or that complex, respectively. Um, and unique associations, sorry about that, I'm repeating this. There we go. Um, we actually identified a whole bunch of interactions, and I'm going to cover these pretty quickly. Um, I'm not going to cover all in the data set. It was much larger than I thought it would be. Um, what what's, I'm going to do is I'm going to try and focus upon the ones that are important relative to disease. But if you're interested in any type of nucleic acid metabolism, I highly suggest you go and look at the database there, including RNA regulation, because it's not just single-strand DNA that these are interacting with, it's also interacting with RNA. And there's an understudied area of research. But let me take you through some of the ones that are relative to disease. Um, I'm gonna quickly go through that. So here is a Venn diagram that actually shows all of the different interactors and the numbers of things that are interacting with RPA4, RPA1, RPA3, or RPA2. And some of them are actually unique to RPA4, but some of them are actually shared by the other ones um, in some way or other. Um, and what's important, first of all, is our BioID identified a whole bunch of complexes of interactions that were already known by individual studies that said, hey, is this protein RPA interacting with, let's say, um, topoisomerase or P53, and those studies were done and we validated those in our bio ID set, which gave us confidence that what we identified was actually good and meaningful. Um, and we wanted to have that to know that we were doing a good experiment. 
Um, the other thing that we notice is um, that um, in addition to those things like PCNA and polymerases, um, we also identified other surprising interactions. Um, and some of them um, I will bring your attention to are HGT, uh, TDP1, um, TDP43. Um, and we pulled these up and we weren't expecting to see these come up in our interactome. Um, so let me show you some of the data. So what this data shows you here is whether there was an interaction with RPA1, 2, or 3, or 4. Um, and there's a dot there. And if there's a dot there, the size of the dot actually tells you the abundance of the interaction. And the significance of it is shown by the color of the circle. And the color um, of the filling of the dot shows you the actual fold of the change of that interaction. And so let's let's focus in upon some of these. So right away, we saw interaction of MSH3 with some of the subunits, but it was predominantly interacting with RPA4 over the other subunits, which would suggest that you're actually having um, interaction of MSH3 with the alternative RPA. And MSH3 is complex with the mutas beta. So MSH2 and MSH3 are actually forming a complex and they're driving repeat expansions and they're interacting with alternative RPA, which isn't a surprise because both of those are actually driving the expansions. So it's interesting that they're actually interacting, at least by bioID. MSH6 is acting, interacting with one, two, and three, but not with four. MSH2 and MSH6 form the immune alpha complex, which are important for base base mismatch repair. Remember, I showed you that immune beta um, is driving expansions, but immune alpha is actually important for base base mismatch repair, and it's actually going to be enhanced by canonical. So it's no surprise that it's interacting, as is MSH2, interacting with the canonical um, mismatch repair, uh, canonical RPA. So that's actually uh, builds up strength in the bio ID, the interaction, as well as the instability effects, both for uh, repeats, but also for base base mismatch repair. Um, the other thing um, that we notice is Huntington seems to be interacting predominantly with the RPA1, um, which I, I don't know what that means, but there's clearly some interest in what the Huntington protein does. Um, but all of these proteins here, have been shown to affect repeat instability in one form or another. And they come up, um, for example, XBG is unique with RPA4, predominantly with RPA4. TDB43 is also interacting with alternative RPA. Um, and I'll talk about that in repeat instability in a minute. Um, we validated these because it's important to validate these. But I think that people are learning that the BioID is a very strong tool and pretty much everything you uh, that has been detected by it has actually been validated, either by direct interaction or by pathway interaction. Much more difficult to do a pathway interaction because if it's not coming up in a direct interaction, um, you, you have to figure out what pathway it's involved, especially if it's novel. But in the case of these proteins, we validated interaction with HGT. Um, we also validated interaction of uh, canonical with MSH6 and MSH3 with alternative RPA and MSH2 with both. We also identified interactions with P53, which has been done so many times by so many labs. Um, and this basically has been done um, in cells. It's also been done with purified proteins. And the purified proteins tell you that it is truly a direct interaction. It also tells you that it's direct with the complex of those proteins. So the interaction of RPA um, is not just mediated by the subunit, it's the whole of the complex with the whole of the mutas alpha or mutas beta complexes, um, which is really confidence building for the interaction. <clears throat> so what about other interactors? So I've just covered those that are involved in repeat instability, um, but there are other interactors um, and the TDB43, I mean, we've only recently shown, and I'll cover that, but the interaction of P53 is also of interest because it's um, with the DNA damage response. So there's a lot of publications on these, and I'm only showing a few of these, why they were interesting to us. And, and they're actually, some of them are fairly old papers showing those interactions. 
Um, and if you're interested in these interactions, we've done a, a very extensive literature um, coverage of what, why they're important, and that's in the recent uh, cell paper. Um, so let's let's talk now about uh, TDB43. TDB43, um, as everybody knows, Manuel studies this heavily um, for uh, its role in uh, transcript um, regulation splicing, but also in various forms of disease. Um, and FUS is also up there as well. And interestingly, these have differential preferential interactions either with alternative RPA for TDB43 or with canonical for FUS1. Um, so what's what's the deal? Why is TDB43 coming up in this screen? Um, and I, I didn't really know what it was. I thought, well, I'll look at that maybe later. I'll call Manuel and say, what do you think is happening here? Um, but actually, um, um, sorry, I'm skipping over a slide. Okay, so TDB43 um, was very recently published to have a role in somatic repeat expansions in Huntington's mice. So I was like, whoa, really? That's really interesting. So my colleague, Peng Jin, did this analysis and showed that if you knock out TDB43 in, in Huntington's mice, you actually change somatic instability. Um, and Leslie Thompson also has a story for TDB43. Hers isn't about repeat instability. It's completely different, but it looks like TDB43 could be important for repeat expansion diseases not just for um, uh, um, C9, but for possibly trinucleotide repeat diseases. And in this paper, they showed an effect upon instability where they actually uh, knocked in a scrambled or they knocked in TDB43. And it's actually having an effect where you're enhancing expansions. So this is very much like FAN1, not like mutas beta. So it's actually um, suppressing expansions. Um, and that study actually um, addressed why that's actually happening. And it seems that it's happening because TDP43 is regulating the level of MSH3 and MLH, um, MSH2. And so that regulation of mismatch repair proteins transcript levels by TDP43 is probably what's regulating repeat expansions in the brain of the Huntington's mice, which is really an interesting new avenue, but it, it doesn't explain why it might be coming up in our bio ID. I still don't know what the meaning is of our bio ID interactions, but it's clearly that uh, TDB43 seems to be interacting predominantly with alternative RPA. Maybe there's a collaboration there that we can do together, Emmanuel. <laughs> so question is, have we identified all other modifiers? But let me go back um, in my slides because I wanted to cover some of the other players. So one of the things that we also noticed is we had a lot of interactions and those interactions included things that were actually um, modifiers of disease. Um, and so I wanted to look at some of those. Um, and one of the ones that I thought was really interesting was RM2. RM2 is part of a complex that actually regulates nucleotide uh, levels inside of um, cells and actually coordinates nucleotides at sites of DNA repair. And this came up as a modifier in the disease age of onset study for Huntington's, um, and it repeatedly did in multiple studies. So it seems that that is important, but whether that regulates instability or not, it seems to have a mild effect upon instability when you knock it out in Huntington's mice. And interestingly, it actually is interacting with RPA as well. Whether there's a mechanism there or not is probably something worth uh, future studies. Um, so then one of the things we asked is about um, going to TCRG1. Um, this has also been a modifier that's come up uh, in the age of onset studies um, and PRC1. And these proteins are also been shown to be involved in um, the survival of neural cells in Huntington's um, mice. And this seems to be an important observation. Why it's interacting and what the interaction is relative to these proteins being interacting specifically with alternative RPA isn't really known, but maybe there's something there again for future study. And some of those papers for TCRG1 are shown here. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna go 
skip this. I want to bring you to the disease. Sorry. We also saw interactions with other proteins that have expansions in them. These are genes that have expansions that cause disease. And I'll bring your attention, it's not so surprising that RFC1, which has an expansion in it um, uh, itself, is its protein also interacting preferentially with the canonical RPA. RFC is replication factor. It's actually coordinating proteins to the DNA, DNA repair proteins, including RPA. So it's not surprising that it came up. Um, what the expansion effect has upon RFC1 interacting with that uh, RPA1 isn't yet known, but there are other genes that have uh, expansions, and those proteins are interestingly interacting with RPA. Um, in most cases, predominantly with um, uh, canonical RPA, uh, but in some cases, alternative RPA. Certainly something worth looking at. I think there's something to be said about a lot of these expansion-containing proteins being uh, interactive with nucleic acids. Um, certainly a place to go in future studies. So, so a question I was asking is, are there, sorry, I'm in the wrong direction. Are there other proteins yet to be discovered? And I would say that there probably are other proteins to be discovered. Um, have we identified all modifiers of instability and have we identified all modifiers of disease? I'd say we have not. And a candidate approach that I've done, um, as well as a GWAS approach uh, that others have done, can actually provide new uh, players in this. And so right now, from the data that I've shown you and the data that many labs have accumulated on repeat instability, it appears that you can have two different pathways where you have a slip out forming, and that could actually give rise to um, both disease and non-disease states. And then in the case where you actually have non-disease, RPA would actually come in and you'd actually have slippage, but it would actually be um, efficiently um, melted out by canonical RPA, and that would give rise to efficient excision by FAN1, which would actually suppress expansions. And if the person didn't have an expansion that they inherited, um, they would end up having stable repeats and no disease. Whereas if they did have an inherited expansion, they would actually have suppression of the downstream effects of the ongoing expansions. Whereas if they actually had the, the case with the alternative RPA, you'd actually have um, coordination with mutus data, which would actually drive the expansions. And that would also possibly involve XBG um, and FAN1, which would not be able to excise it because it's not being melted properly. And that would actually give rise to enhanced expansions which would have enhancing effects on the downstream effects of those expansions. So basically today I've told you about repeat instability and all the different factors that are actually involved. And I told you about alternative RPA, which could potentially be a therapeutic target to actually um, suppress the driving of expansions that it mediates, um, but also our canonical RPA as a new suppressor of these expansions and this is also not just a modifier of instability, but also because it's modifying disease in the mice, it's a modifier of disease. Um, and targeting these could also affect not just arrest expansions, but it could also induce contractions um, by modulating their ability to process these slip DNAs. So I'd like to take time to thank everybody. Um, this was a huge amount of work, uh, not just by my lab, um, there's a lot of labs that participated uh, in that, and I would like to point out um, the work of uh, Hitoshi Okazawa um, and the lab of um, Masayuki and um, Kazuhiko, um, but there's also the labs of Richard Fall, uh, Mark Wold, I've been working with Mark Wold forever, which is great, and Alice Fada and Bev Davidson's group, and I'd like to thank all of the uh, funding agencies, and I'd like to thank particularly the families. And I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you.